Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you for joining us today for the Anchor Study Virtual Town Hall. This is the first of four virtual town halls that we're organizing. We want to especially thank you for joining us on a Saturday and giving us your precious time. Also want to make a special welcome for some of you who will be joining uh, as a viewing party, particularly in uh, the DC area. The uh, idea for today is to talk about what the anchor study was and uh, what the results were and what they mean, and to offer lots of time for anybody on the call to ask questions of study leadership um, and other panelists. So my name is Dr. Joel Polevsky. I'm the protocol chair of the anchor study. I designed it and led it throughout the course of the study and continue to lead the study now. And we'll talk a little bit more about what's going on uh, now. Uh, before we get into the, uh, the meat of the, the study, I'd like to just uh, cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, the first is that we do have Spanish interpretation services available. There is a button on your screen for interpretation. And if you go to that and press Spanish, then you will hear a Spanish interpreter uh, of, uh, of my remarks. If you are dialing in by telephone, you may not see that on your screen. So if you're on a phone, you need to go to the section uh, of the controls called more, which is three dots. And if you press on that, you should see interpretation as uh, one of the options. The other thing you may be noticing is that there's a pop-up screen, uh, which is a, an audience poll. It's not really so much a poll in the traditional sense. It is a, a request on our part for us to know who you are. We don't uh, identify you by name, everything is anonymous, but we'd like to know, for instance, if you are a current anchor study participant, a past anchor study participant, a member of the community, whoever you may be, we'd love to know who you are. And so we would really appreciate it if you could pick one of the boxes on that uh, audience poll and then the pop-up should disappear. Again, your responses are totally anonymous. The top part of the poll is in English, the second part is in Spanish. So if you want to, see it in Spanish, then please um, just uh, scroll down. Um, Bienvenidos um, a el webinar. Eh, si quieren escuchar en español, pueden presionar el icono de interpretación, que es el globo que pueden ver la, en la pantalla. Y si tienen de un teléfono, pueden poner los tres botones azules. Quizás estamos experimentando un poco de dificultad eh, poniendo o iniciando la interpretación, entonces por favor tengan paciencia. Pero una vez iniciada, deberían ser capaces de hacer clic en el botón de interpretación. Gracias, Carolina. So here's how we're going to organize the next hour. Um, again, this is really meant to be a community meeting. It's not meant to be a lecture. It's meant to be a discussion. Uh, that's challenging over the internet. So we're going to do our best to try and keep this interactive. Uh, I'm going to start off with some introductions to uh, introduce some of the other members of the team. I'm going to talk about why we did the study and about the anal cancer problem and the precursor to anal cancer, which we call HSIL. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we'll talk about the results of the study and what it means for, for you. Uh, my hope is that this will take no more than 25 minutes and we will have a good half hour or so for questions and answers. I'm going to talk a little bit more in a bit about how to do the questions and answers, but before I do that, I want to just introduce some other people, some of whom are on this call, some of whom will be on one of the other three town hall uh, meetings that we're going to be holding in the next few weeks. The co-chair of our study is Hillary Dunleavy. Uh, she's not on today, but I am joined today by Isabella Rosa Cunha, who is a member of the senior study leadership. 
and who is going to be moderating the question and answer period for today. She's based at the University of Miami. We also, at various uh, time points and for various meetings, will have members of the Community Advisory Board. And today we're very lucky to have with us uh, Bill Freshwater, who's uh, our, one of our Community Advisory Board members. And uh, we will hear from Derek Mapp and John McFeely in um, one or more of the other meetings. And that's me there on the upper left. I'm based at uh, the University of California, San Francisco. So I am, uh, as you may see in the background, um, coming here from San Francisco, though in truth, I'm sitting in my living room at home. So how to ask questions during this town hall meeting. <clears throat> There's another button that you need to pay attention to for this. This is the Q and A button. It's shown below on this slide. And if you have a question, you should feel free to type it in anytime during the presentation. You don't have to wait till the end of the presentation, but uh, they will be read by Dr. Uh, Isabella uh, for discussion. They may not be read if it's a similar question and she is combining one or more into the same question, but we will certainly try and get to the topic. Um, the other thing to note is that if you are speaking in Spanish, you should feel free to type the question in Spanish and the question will be uh, translated into English. Again, uh, these are meant to be anonymous. There is a little button for you to press when you see that, uh, which is um, to send anonymous. That means that when you send the question, your name will not be attached. If you forget to send that, your name may be attached to the message, but it will only be seen by uh, Dr. Rosa Cunha. And of course, when she reads the question, she will not divulge her name. So we would prefer if you sent it anonymously, but if you forget, you can be assured that uh, your anonymity will still be preserved. If um, you have other questions that you feel more comfortable addressing one-on-one, -on -one, uh, if you're an anchor participant, you should feel free to contact the local study team at the site where you participated, and they will be happy to discuss these questions. If you are not an anchor participant, you uh, may want to discuss this with your primary care provider or someone that he or she refers you to for further information. If uh, you are watching a uh, live stream uh, on YouTube, then uh, you can also contact the national team through our study website. The website is shown here, www.anchorstudy.org. Any questions that you have uh, there will also be forwarded to the appropriate person and someone will be very happy to get back to you. So with that introduction, uh, I'd like to start the presentation by giving you just a little bit of background on anal high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions and anal cancer. So uh, the anus, I know uh, we all know we have one, but we may not know that much about it, surprisingly, even though we sit on it every day and do other things. So what is it? It is part of your gastrointestinal tract, which starts at your mouth and goes through your stomach and then the large intestine, sorry, the small intestine and the large intestine, the rectum, and then finally, at the very end, is the anus, which is shown here. So here's the rectum, and at the very tip is the anus, which is the final part of the GI tract, and which goes out to the opening, and then into the what we call the perianal or outside anal part. So the anus is actually kind of two organs in one. It's the very end of the inside, which is moist, and then a portion of the outside. All these are important because these are areas where you can get anal cancer, and so we pay attention to all of it. This, um, this diagram also shows what's called the sphincter muscle. This is the muscle that <clears throat> keeps your anal opening closed most of the time, unless you're having a bowel movement or having intercourse. It's a muscle that keeps it closed and keeps us from being incontinent 
or needing to go to the bathroom all the time. When we are doing procedures, which I'll describe in a little bit of detail, some of the discomfort is passing through that part of the anus uh, where we're pushing on the muscle and to try to get it to open. But once it's open, then it's relatively straightforward to insert our instruments a little bit further up without too, too much extra discomfort. Now, all of this problem, you know, cancer, you know, H cell is caused by a virus called human papillomavirus or HPV. This is a sexually transmitted virus and almost all of us get it. At least 80% of all adults will get a genital HPV infection at some point in time during their lives. When you get that virus, um, many different things can happen. Most often, nothing happens. Um, most of us who get HPV don't really have any obvious abnormalities from it. But unfortunately, and some do, and when you do have a problem from HPV, it can cause a variety of issues. It can cause warts on the skin if the virus is elsewhere on your skin besides the genital tract, such as the hands or the feet. Those are not necessarily sexually transmitted, but they are caused by HPV. Uh, the sexually transmitted ones can cause anal and genital warts, meaning on the vulva if, or on the penis. Um, they can cause precancer, and uh, they can, in a small percentage of cases, cause cancer. The problem is that since so many of us get HPV, even if they cause cancer in only a small proportion, that means that that can still result in a large number of people getting the cancer. So let's start with the cancer precursor, which we call HCIL. That stands for high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. This is what we were looking for in the ANCHOR study, uh, as well as cancer. HCIL is not cancer. As you see here, the bottom of this has got like a floor. It's called the basement membrane. And as long as these cells are on top of it, even if they're very abnormal and they look like they might become cancerous, as long as these cells stay on top there, they're not cancer. It only becomes cancer when the cells decide, as I'll show you in the next slide, to cross through this floor into the area below this floor of the basement membrane. The problem with the H cell is although it is not cancer, it has the potential to turn into cancer in some people if left alone long enough. And that's um, good news in a sense because it gives us the opportunity, if we find these in time, to remove these areas to prevent the development of cancer. Oftentimes these will go away on their own, but they may also recur. And the other piece of good news is it's not terribly difficult to treat these. We can remove them through a variety of methods that uh, some of you may have experienced in the anchor study and which I'll describe uh, in a short bit. Again, as long as it doesn't turn into cancer, it is not going to be a big problem. But the problem is we don't know which turn into cancer and which don't. And so we feel that it's prudent to try and treat all of them uh, to try and prevent a cancer. So here's what the cancers look like. Here you see those cells breaking the basement membrane and going down below that. These cells can spread locally and cause blockage of some of the organs in your pelvic region, uh, or they can spread through the blood or the lymph system to distant organs like your lungs or your liver, where they can also uh, cause very serious damage and potentially kill you. So uh, this is a serious disease, and the usual treatment is combination of chemotherapy, you get drugs usually by intravenous method, combined with radiation to the area in the pelvis where the cancer is found. The other problem is that we find that these cancers are more common in people living with HIV than people who don't have HIV. In fact, people with HIV, particularly men who have sex with men living with HIV, have the highest rates of anal cancer of all groups. We honestly don't know for sure how many people would develop anal cancer if we did nothing, but our best estimate right now 
is that over the course of a lifetime, um, a man who has sex with men living with HIV could have as high as 10% risk of developing an anal cancer. Um, that means 90% of people won't. That's obviously good news. But in our opinion, 10% is a too high number. It's a very high number, in fact. And um, one of the reasons for that, I'll show you on the next slide, is that anal cancer, even if it's cured, can cause lots of problems for a person. Interestingly, if you just look at the whole population, the general population, in, which includes people with HIV as a relatively small proportion, the cancers are found most often in women uh, compared with men. So although I've told you that MSM living with HIV are at the very highest risk, women can also develop anal cancer. So why do we focus on preventing this cancer? Well, most of the time when we do diagnose the cancer, it's caught early and the survival rate after treatment is very good. So you may say, what's the big deal? The big deal is, as I mentioned, the treatment is chemoradiation therapy and that treatment can be very, very nasty and cause lots of long-term, very bad side effects, such as bleeding, such as pain, such as incontinence, can cause depression. It's, it's definitely worth trying to avoid chemoradiation therapy if you can. And then if the cancer is found later, even with the chemoradiation therapy, survival is poor. So caught early or caught late, anal cancer is better prevented. So how do we do that? Well, we, we do that by looking for and treating these high-grade lesions and removing it before it can progress to cancer. But first we have to figure out who needs the procedure to do that, which we call high-resolution anoscopy, because we cannot do high-resolution anoscopy, also called the HRA. We can't do that on everybody because we don't have enough doctors and other clinicians to do that. So we need to screen to uh, decide who needs HRA. This is very similar to pap smear screening in the cervix that women get to decide which women should get the next step in their evaluation, which is called colposcopy. So anal and cervical disease and the methods that we use to prevent the cancers at these locations are actually very, very similar. In the case of anal disease, we typically start off with a digital anorectal examination to feel if, for any lumps or bumps that are suspicious for cancer. And if there is, then we will refer you to someone who can take a good look to find that cancer if it is there. After the digital anorectal exam is done, uh, then we will typically do uh, an anal swab if we're screening for HRA. In fact, if you are being screened, first you'll have the anal swab because we cannot put lubrication on it. So that procedure on the right is typically done first. Then we'll do the digital anorectal exam because we can put lubricant on the finger to do that. If one of those screening tests is positive, or if you were screened as part of the anchor study, where you didn't actually go through those procedures, we did HRA on everybody and did the, those procedures as part of the overall assessment at that visit, then to do the HRA after the person has put their finger in for digital anorectal exam, we insert the scope and then use a bunch of tricks to try and find the high-grade lesions. Uh, if we see them, then we'll typically take a small piece, a biopsy about the size of a sesame seed, and look at it under the microscope to look for H cell and to rule out a cancer. If the uh, biopsy does show H cell, then the usual approach is to remove that also by doing high resolution anoscopy. But in this case, we put a device through the scope and destroy the tissue by touching the lesion, the H cell, usually with electrocautery, electricity, or in this case, we're showing with heat. Either way, it's a very targeted treatment to remove those lesions. Occasionally we'll use creams, but most often we find that these targeted treatments work the best. So let's now talk about the anchor study specifically. I told you that cervical and anal cancer are very similar diseases, and we know that treating cervical H cell reduces the risk of cervical cancer. So why haven't we been just screening for and treating 
these anal H cell lesions all along to prevent anal cancer? And the answer is shown here at the bottom is that until we did anchor, we had no evidence that that approach actually worked. And we like to have evidence before we make recommendations so that we're not causing more harm than good when we're doing uh, procedures for a patient. So we did the anchor study to find out if treating these anal precancerous lesions actually works to prevent anal cancer. And to do so, we had two study groups, one in which we treated the anal H cell as best we could, and the other where we watched it very carefully and counted up the number of cases of cancer in both of these groups over time. This is a very big study, and we did it at multiple sites. And the study was a result of a lot of people contributing. And I also want to make sure that um, the National Cancer Institute is acknowledged for the very uh, generous funding that they provided for this study. So this was a study funded by the National Cancer Institute of the NIH. So as I said, a big study, we ended up screening 10,723 people uh, for the anchor study. We found 4,459 who were eligible because they had HCIL, and we ended up following in the study almost all, 4,446. Uh, 6,247 were not eligible and were therefore not enrolled. And we also found 17 cancers at screening. Obviously, we didn't enroll these individuals. Instead, we sent them directly for care of their cancer. So what happened? We have two groups here. We have the treatment arm. We have the monitoring arm. And in the treatment arm, we found over time that nine cancers developed compared with 21 in the group where we did not treat the H cell. So clearly, the having the treatment for the H cell was having a beneficial effect. When we look at who was in the study, because we want to know how representative was the study group compared to those who were not in the anchor study, can the results that we find in this group be extended to everybody else living with HIV? And the answer we think is yes, because the people who participated in anchor were quite representative of the overall US HIV population. We had mostly men, but a substantial proportion of women, 4% were transgender, and we had um, good representation of Black, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic Blacks, and Asian Pacific Islanders. Again, quite similar to what we find in the overall USHIV population. Another piece of very good news is that procedures that were done, whether they were in the monitoring arm or in the treatment arm, uh, were very safe. We did many thousands of study visits and only eight participants had some serious side effects caused by the procedures that we did, and these pretty much resolved um, quickly. So the study procedures were generally well tolerated. So overall, with the nine and the 21 in the two groups, we um, saw a 57% reduction in anal cancer progression from HCIL to cancer in the treatment arm compared with the monitoring arm. And so that means that when we treat HCIL with the currently available treatments, predominantly the electrocautery, that we can prevent cancer more than half the time. And this was a statistically significant result. So the next steps for the study, of course, once we knew that the study was showing that treatment was effective, we stopped it because we wanted to make sure that everybody who was in the monitoring arm would have the opportunity to get their lesion treated if they wanted to do so. So the uh, st study was stopped. And while we reorganized to get ready to uh, treat everybody who was in the monitoring arm, we arranged also to continue to follow people in the uh, treatment arm. So uh, we now recommend treatment for everybody based on the results of the anchor study. We still want to see you if you, uh, even if you choose not to get treated at this point so that we can continue to monitor you. Um, the bottom line, if you'll pardon the expression, is that we want to see everybody who was in the anchor study at some point in time and who, for whatever reason, has not yet quite come back for a follow-up visit. So thank you to those of you who have come back. And please, if 
you are considering coming back but haven't yet done so, we would love to see you. Please contact your local study team. We are going to continue to follow people uh, this way until the end of September of 2024. So based on the results of the anchor study, and thanks to the contributions of the participants of the anchor study, without which everything couldn't be possible, we did everything that was done was because of the uh, the contributions of the community and anchor study participants. We are now in the process of working with the Centers for Disease Control and other uh, agencies to determine whether we can make screening for and treating anal HCIL a standard of care for everybody living with HIV. Um, and that's going to have, I think, a quite important benefit for the entire community of HIV. Um, we also think that when it becomes standard of care, uh, it will also help to lessen some of the problems that people have in terms of getting procedures covered through their insurance. It'll be easier to get a procedure and it will also convince more clinicians to gear up to provide this because once it becomes standard of care, then it becomes more of an obligation to do this uh, because in the past people have often said to us, well, it's very interesting, very important, but let's see what the study shows before we jump in. And now we think they need to jump in. In addition, um, we had over the course of the study collected a variety of specimens, uh, swabs, blood, tissue from the anchor study participants to create a very unique bank of tissues that we think will provide us with additional really important information regarding the best screening tests to decide who should get HRA, and also what we call biomarkers, which are tests that we can perform to um, predict, for instance, who is likely to progress to cancer so that we can really focus our attention on that, who may be more likely to show spontaneous regression to normal, meaning we don't need to pay so much attention to that person, um, and also identify the reasons that these precancers like HCIL are progressing in some cases to cancer, uh, because if we know what's changing, then maybe we can interfere with that process, and that could represent potentially an important new treatment. So the information from the specimens donated by the anchor participants, I think are gonna be absolutely critical to helping us in the next step, which is to now design the best screening programs and the best monitoring and treatment programs. And then finally, although the study was focused exclusively on people with HIV, we think that the results may be relevant for other people. For example, men who have sex with men who are not living with HIV or women who may have had uh, HCL and cervix uh, or people who are immunosuppressed for reasons other than HIV. We think that uh, the anchor results should encourage screening for and treating HCL in those groups too, but these are discussions that are still underway. Our primary focus right now is first to get the guidelines in place uh, for people living with HIV. So in summary, can I stop anal H cell from becoming cancer? Um, you can go a very long way towards doing that. Uh, we strongly recommend that you continue to get HRA. And if you if we do find H cell to get it treated, um, you are, again, if you were in the anchor study, strongly encouraged to stay in it, to come back. We love you. Please come back. Um, but uh, if you choose to be seen by another practitioner, that's great. We just want you to be monitored and taken care of. We also strongly encourage you to participate in other clinical trials that may be uh, offered by anchor study staff or others, because we still have a ways to go to uh, improve on the treatment of anal age cell. It works right now, but we can do even better and we always want to do better. And then as far as your own health is concerned, some of the things that we think may increase your risk of anal cancer, uh, there are some things that you have some control over. For example, smoking increases the risk of anal cancer. We strongly recommend that if you're smoking or vaping, that you quit if, if at all possible. And then continuing to take good care of your HIV is critical as well. 
most of you do, uh, strongly encourage staying in care, taking the meds, making sure that your HIV viral load is well controlled. As I mentioned, there are other studies that are going on. So if you're um, approached to volunteer for one of those, please strongly consider it. We've already seen how your contributions have helped uh, the community and yourselves to uh, reduce the risk of a very bad disease. And again, we're extremely grateful for that. And um, we hope that you will continue to work with us to improve medical care for anal cancer prevention. So lastly, Anchor was a landmark study. It was published in the best journal around, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, got a lot of attention. For the first time, we showed that h cell treatment lowered the risk of anal cancer, and we expect this to help people with HIV and others as well. We are working with those uh, results and different agencies to try and get new medical guidelines for care to improve access to anal cancer prevention, but there's still a lot more to do. And that uh, involves looking for these biomarkers and trying to improve treatments amongst others. And of course, as more information becomes available, we will have more events such as these to make sure that everybody is fully informed as to what's going on. So I think we're ready to start our question and answer session. Um, again, please remember to type your question into the Q&A box, press um, the anonymous button if you can remember to do that. And um, you can also type your questions in in Spanish. So I'm going to open that question and answer period up to Isabella, who will read the questions and direct them to, to the right person. Isabella? Here I am. Hello, everyone. Uh, please feel free, again, let me reinforce your type of questions. I also have some questions we've been receiving from participants and from the community. Uh, I have the first question here. Uh, is at the end of the study, will primary doctor have access to results and the treatment to the information from the study so they can transition care? Um, so the answer is that we will provide those data upon request. Uh, we don't routinely send out that information to all primary care doctors after every visit, but we are happy to provide that information upon request from a primary care person uh, if they want that. There is another question uh, just asking you to reinforce for how long the study will run as for the participants. Right. So um, we are currently planning to continue the follow-up in the study until September 30th, 2024. So that's another, uh, what, a year and a half or so uh, from now. So that gives um, participants the opportunity to be seen several times uh, until that point. Over this period of year and a half or so, we intend to start working with participants to try and uh, develop plans for what happens after that. Uh, in many cases, uh, participants will continue to be seen at the uh, places where they were participating in Anchor by the same providers, but outside the context of Anchor. And in other cases, they may need to be referred to uh, new practitioners or people outside of the, the Anchor family directly. So this is something we'll be doing one-on-one -on -one with participants to try and make a plan. I'm glad you mentioned that because we have been receiving several questions from the community and participants regarding the concern of transition in care. I think I already said that there is a concern also from many people that have been sending us questions regarding payments because they have through the study, they have the benefit of having deductibles and co-pays covered by the study. And they are concerned that once they transition care, this may become a problem. This is, has been also a question from people who are not in the study, but they are now interested in screening. Do you have something to say about that? And you already mentioned in the presentation, some of the uh, results may help, but can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on that since many people have been interested in hearing from you? That's a great question. Before I answer it, I also just want to acknowledge that Hillary Dunleavy has joined us. So welcome, Hillary. Um, 
And so if uh, you have anything to say, please chime in as well. Um, uh, one of the benefits of the of being in the anchor study was our ability to cover the costs of copays and deductibles. Um, once the anchor study is over and medical care transitions to, for lack of a better word, routine clinical care, i.e. follow up outside the anchor study, then the issues that are associated with uh, insurance, copays, deductibles, may actually um, become more of a problem. It's hard to generalize because everybody's situation is different depending on the kind of medical coverage that they have. What I'm hoping is that by then, we will already have guidelines uh, that recommend screening and treatment as standard of care. Uh, and while I expect that that will not completely get rid of copays and deductibles, um, that it may perhaps uh, reduce the burden associated with those, again, depending on uh, the uh, carrier, the insurance carrier of, of the person. Um, so it will be a challenge, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a challenge for virtually every kind of medical procedure that people may need to get in the course of their, their health care. So in this sense, doing endoscopies and biopsies and treatment are, are no different. But if these do become adopted as standard of care, our, our hope slash expectation is that processes will become uh, smoother, less difficult, better access, and hopefully uh, less financial burden. Thank you. There is a question here regarding the frequency of the visits. If you expect that the visits will continue to be every six months, and I will aggregate to this question another question that we've received from the community. Do you, how do the study or the data being analyzed will uh, define, or if you believe it will define uh, the, uh, the, the length within uh, uh, follow-ups? If you are, so, Patients are, let me try to make it clear. There is a question asking if it's expected that every six months will be the usual follow-up. And if the information from this study may come up with a different algorithm in terms of uh, visits. Right. <clears throat> so um, the algorithm that we used in the study was the kind of algorithm that we expected we would want to use in routine clinical care if the um, if the study was positive, meaning that it did show prevention of cancer, and of course it did. So uh, six month follow up um, for people with high grade disease uh, would not be considered uh, out of the realm of what we would expect. Uh, we we still don't have very clearly defined follow up algorithms for HSIL. Um, but remember that now we're hoping that everybody is going to get treated for their HCL. And the follow up for somebody who's been treated for HCL will be different from somebody who we had been monitoring without treatment when they were in the monitoring arm. Um, the monitoring visits uh, intervals for people who've been treated for HCL depend to a large extent on how successful that treatment was. So, if, speaking for myself in my own clinic, when I treat someone for HCL, I typically follow them four months later. And if they're clear at four months, I start to increase the visit interval. And the longer they stay clear of HCL, the longer, the progressively longer the study interval visits until you know I get to see people every year, every two years. But if this is someone who uh, has had only an incomplete response or continues to have new lesions popping up, frequently, then that's someone who I do try and see on a more regular basis. So to, just to summarize, we aim to follow every six months or even less frequently if possible, but we sometimes feel the need to follow more frequently depending on how a person responds to treatment. And that really has to be individualized uh, on a per patient basis. 
All right, thank you. So we have another question here. So um, they think that they are acknowledging how great it is to know that uh, you can treat the high grade. Uh, should we be concerned how this might impact our health plans that might choose from healthcare marketplace insurance plans? What they mean that burning the high seal can prevent renal cancer, but it's not 100% fail proof. So how can, uh, you know, what we've done so far can be convincing to insurance plans and get having access. I think it goes back to what we, we said a little bit earlier, but it looks like, it, again, it's still a concern. So one of participants is asking. Sure. So I think uh, the person who's asking the question is sort of getting at the issue uh, that since we didn't prevent all renal cancers, we only prevented 57%, uh, might that make it harder for them to convince an insurance carrier to cover these procedures? Uh, I don't actually think so. Although, again, as I mentioned, we would have loved to have prevented more than 57%, and we have new treatment, new treatments in the pipeline that we want to assess. So I'm optimistic that we will get better treatments for HCL in the future. The result that we have alone from Anchor is convincing. And there are relatively few things in medicine that are 100%. So even if we were only, and I put in quotation marks, only able to reduce the risk of anal cancer by nearly 60%, that should not be a rationale for any insurance carrier to say, no, they're not going to do it. What they will base that decision on is the recommendations of some of these agencies that we talked about with the CDC, um, because uh, many insurance carriers fall in line when guidelines are put out like this. There will also be uh, formal assessments. They're called cost-benefit analyses. There's different kinds of harms and benefits of any medical procedure. This is one of them, um, where we know what the benefits are now in, in terms of how much cancer we can prevent. And then somebody, I'm sure, not me, somebody is going to sit down and figure out uh, what, the, uh, what the harms are. What could a harm be to all of these relatively benign procedures that I've been describing? Well, you have to spend time to come to the office, having a swab put in to your anal area and a finger are um, sometimes uncomfortable. Uh, having the anoscopy, the high resolution anoscopy, the biopsies can sometimes be uncomfortable. They rarely cause side effects. Uh, the treatment can be uncomfortable. Uh, again, rarely causes serious side effects, but all of these things do have a cost. On the other side of the equation, there is substantial benefit in terms of the number of people who won't be needing treatment for anal cancer and all of the benefits associated with that. And so <clears throat> we have ways of determining whether the, uh, the size of the harms versus the size of the benefits <clears throat> is sufficiently good that um, it would be recommended routinely again by the agencies that focus on that particular issue. And uh, if a procedure has a sufficiently good cost-benefit ratio, um, then again, most insurance companies are more than happy to, to sign on to that. There is a big issue though, because even if they say, yes, you can have it, that doesn't mean it's gonna be so easy and not because the insurance carrier, but because we currently have a very serious shortage of individuals trained right now in the United States to do high resolution endoscopy. It takes a long time to get really good at this procedure. It took a long time to train the anchor clinicians to be the world leaders that they are in seeing patients. But you can imagine that if uh, the results um, of the anchor study achieve what we hope they're gonna achieve, namely making this standard care for everybody, the number of people who should get this procedure uh, and will want this procedure will go up very dramatically. Uh, but the number of people who can handle it are still relatively limited. So another one of our aims is to start to ramp up training programs. But now that, or if it does become standard of care as we are optimistic it will, 
it will become easier to convince people to want to become trained because they know they're not going to have the problems of insurance, et cetera, uh, insurance coverage for what they're doing. Um, then um, you know, we will need to expand the pool of people who are capable of doing the procedures that were done in the anchor study. And that's going to take some time because, again, uh, finding the right people and the time that it takes to get really good at this uh, will uh, lead to some delays in having widespread access. But and we have to start somewhere, and that's certainly on our list of plans. And related to what you just mentioned regarding providers, we've been receiving about, about a lot of inquiries regarding where to find an HRA provider, including from patients who are, from people who are not part of the study but are becoming aware of the results. Right. So uh, I, I think, frankly, that uh, if you, well, let's start, if you were in the anchor study, you know where to go. If you live in a city or a location nearby where the anchor study was performed, uh, what I would suggest maybe is to contact the local study team, tell them that you weren't in the anchor study, but um, you are interested in potentially being screened and or having HRA, and they might say, well, come to see us. It wouldn't be as part of the anchor study, but the same clinicians do see people outside the anchor study or they may know of other people in the community who they trust to, to recommend that you see. If you live in an area where the anchor study wasn't done, whether or not you're an anchor study participant, then it gets a little trickier. And uh, in that case, um, you may want to go to the website of the International Anal Neoplasia Society, um, which is the professional society that, um, uh, that, that we have for people who do HRA and treatment. Uh, and um, Isabella and or Hillary, do we know if they have an up-to-date list of providers who say they're willing to see participants in different locations? Yeah, they do have a list and many people have been finding providers through the list of the society. So it's a good resource. Could we put that in the chat? It's, sure. It's www.iansoc.org. Uh, and we'll, we'll put that in the chat for you to copy if you want to, to go to there. Um, another resource may be your own primary care provider. There's a good chance he or she has already been asked that question by one of their other patients. And they may already have given some thought to who uh, who they want to uh, refer to. I do want to be clear about one thing, though. That is to do everything we've been talking about: the screening, the HRA, the treatments. Does require a fairly uh, extensive infrastructure of people of di with different kinds of skills at a site. So it's not just the HRA provider; it's also we also feel like, for instance, uh, an anal surgeon should be part of the team because occasionally people do need to be referred for uh, to see a, an anal surgeon or a proctologist. Uh, what I discourage people from doing is getting screened, i.e. having a swab put in either for cytology or for HPV testing uh, if there is not a plan or an ability to see somebody to act on the result if it's abnormal. In other words, I've frequently been asked over the years, um, how do I set up um, uh, an anal screening program? Which again, typically will involve the digital anorectal exam and, and the insertion of the swab. Well, um, there are skills associated with that, but they're not all that difficult. The hard part of it really is uh, is the next step, which is high resolution anoscopy and so on. And it is my personal opinion that if you, if where you live, you do not have access to somebody who can do HRA, I don't think there's much value in getting screened uh, for that uh, because there's nothing you can do about it. In that situation, I still recommend that your provider do an annual digital anorectal exam because they can still. Um, 
feel for lumps or bumps that may indicate the presence of a cancer, and that's valuable, or other problems too can be found. So you should definitely have an annual digital anorectal exam. And if your provider cannot refer you to somebody who does HRA, I would not do any further screening tests, but I would strongly encourage that provider to figure out how to uh, start to assemble a group that can provide that service. I'm not saying uh, give up on it, but I'm saying uh, until the entire range of services available, at least do the DARE, but work with your medical team to at least get going in being able to provide the full range of services that you deserve. Thank you, Joe. I have a last question here, and please feel free. We still have a few minutes if you want to type more questions, but I have a last question here is uh, asking us if the information we are getting from the study, somehow what we are analyzing now, can predict the people who have high grade progressing to cancer. Right, so um, very good question. I guess that's really important because what we found was that over half of the people in the community, in the, in the screen group from the community had a high grade lesion. So um, having these high grade lesions is very, very common. We would prefer to not have to do a lot of procedures on half of the whole community to be able to prevent cancer. And that's where these biomarkers come in because we'd love to know which is the person who is more likely to progress to cancer than the other person so that we can leave the other person relatively alone and not bother them unnecessarily and focus our attention on the people who are most likely to progress to cancer. We have some guesses as to who is more likely to progress to cancer, but it's pretty crude. And it's based on some of the questionnaire data that we collected in Anchor, for instance. We think that people who have bigger lesions at the beginning may be more likely to progress. And we also, as I mentioned, know that smoking is a risk factor and people who are older are also at higher risk. So. If you're older, if you're a smoker, and if you have a bigger lesion, you're probably at higher risk of some of progression to cancer than somebody who's got a smaller lesion who doesn't smoke and is younger. But that's, again, pretty crude. We are planning on using the biobank of specimens collected from anchor participants uh, over the course of the study to do some analysis in the laboratory to help us look at the molecular level at the tissues to discriminate between the high-grade lesions that progressed from the ones that don't, so that we can perhaps, if we're lucky, uh, find something and turn that into a test. Maybe it'll be a blood test. Maybe it'll be something we do on the tissue on a biopsy or maybe even on a swab. But we would love to have a test that says, oh, your risk based on this test looks pretty high. We should get you treated right away. Or uh, on, the other, on the other hand, oh, this test is negative, you're more likely to, for your H cell to go away on its own or not progress to cancer. I don't need to follow you quite as often. Let's see you in a year instead of every six months, that, that kind of thinking. So the answer is uh, it's a very active area of investigation. Um, and we're really hoping that we will be able to uh, determine with more precision who is likely to progress and who won't. Great, and I just want someone here just put in the Q&A that he felt it was great to be part of this. That is actually more of a statement, but he wants to share. He felt really great to be part of this study. He was initially in the screening and then later on after the results, he got treated. So he wants to share his appreciation. Great, thank you. I also was reminded, <laughs> unfortunately, that you cannot see anything that we put in the chat. So let me repeat the website for the International Neoplasia Society. Again, uh, it is www.ian as in Nancy S O C I A N S O C dot O R G dot org. And uh, please contact your local anchor study site if if I got if I wasn't uh, clear enough or if you can't find it they will happily uh, send you that information or the National Anchor Study um, website. We'll be happy to ask answer those questions too. 
There is one more question here, Joe, we have a few more minutes. And uh, there is some one concern here. If, if you are in a location where proper care cannot be provided, not pursuing a screening put the patient at risk because of not uh, doing thing, you know, not doing anything. They might want to relocate to a different location because of that. You know, the results are so uh, robust that people may think about that. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. Um, it's not an option for everybody. But if you have the ability, maybe not to relocate, I would hope you don't pick up and move to another city for this reason. But you may want to, for instance, spend a night or two nights in another city. Um, to take care of this, you know, that's certainly an option um, for, for some people, again, not for everybody. But uh, I'm really referring to people who have no way of getting HRA. That makes me very unhappy. I wish everybody had access to HRA now. Uh, and again, that's going to, going to be a process and was awaiting the results of the anchor study. But now we have them and it's now our obligation I think, to try and improve access to HRA. But again, I want to emphasize that if there is no way of getting HRA, at a minimum, people should get the digital anal rectal exam. All clinicians know how to do that or should know how to do that. And we all have the equipment to do that. That's our finger. So uh, I don't believe there's any reason why every person living with HIV shouldn't be getting a digital anal rectal exam uh, at least on an annual basis. That's great. We cover all the questions and then we're almost at the end of the hour. Great. Well, um, if there are no further questions, then um, I would like to uh, thank everybody who participated uh, in this uh, webinar. We're really grateful again for you taking some time on a Saturday to talk about the results of the anchor study. This is going to be available uh, online. So if um, you know people who uh, weren't able to participate today and who won't be able to participate in one of the other three upcoming town halls, then uh, this is uh, an option for them. Uh, please um, do consider attending one of the other town halls too particularly if you have questions that come up or which uh, weren't uh, completely answered uh, in the course of this hour. Um, the uh, online recording is going to be available through the Anchor Studies YouTube account, and that you'll be able to access that from the Anchor Study um, website that uh, I already mentioned. We also uh, want to ask you as people who are clearly interested in this problem to tell people about the results of the anchor study. Um, you know, we talk about it a lot amongst ourselves as clinicians, we publish our results, but when all is said and done, um, they're not helpful unless the people who would benefit most from them know about them. That's one of the reasons we do these town halls, but we only reach a limited number of people People talking amongst themselves is a very effective way of spreading information. So talk to your friends, talk to your relatives, talk to your loved ones, post something on the internet, um, on social media. I do also want to mention that on March 4th, which is about a month from now, it's International HPV Awareness Day. I actually lead this global campaign and we are planning on talking about anal cancer as part of that. So um, please participate in that campaign too. Um, and the information about that campaign is at a, yet another website for the International Papillomavirus Society. That's www.ipvsoc.org. Um, so uh, we do wanna make sure that uh, as many people as possible hear about the anchor study results and um, and spread the information to people who might benefit them from them who weren't part of the study. Again, I also wanna remind any of you who have not yet been seen uh, since the study uh, was stopped uh, for, for the randomization part of the study, if you were particularly, if you were part of the active monitoring arm 
and haven't been back for a while, we really, really want to see you. It's not too late. So please come back. Uh, and I, I can't end also without once again thanking the participants in the community who made the anchor study the landmark finding that it was. We absolutely could not have done it without your contributions. We're extremely grateful. We hope that you're very proud of what you've done. It's an, a tremendous accomplishment. And I also want to thank the Community Advisory Board today, represented by Bill Freshwater, who really helped us in so many, many ways. And the study teams, uh, the 17 to 25 sites around the United States where the study was performed at different times, study coordinators, uh, clinicians, uh, community outreach. It was a huge effort and uh, everybody played a, a really pivotal role. And again, finally, I do want to acknowledge uh, our very um, wonderful colleagues at the National Cancer Institute who felt that this was an, uh, an important enough problem to invest uh, a very substantial amount of resources uh, to see that it was done properly. So thank you to, to them too. Um, Isabella or Carolina, was there anything else that we need to cover today? From the questions, we covered it all. Great. Well, I we will conclude then. Thank you all very much again. Come back to one of the other town halls or watch the uh, proceedings on YouTube. And I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Yay. We did it. <laughs> I guess the next one is on me. Wednesday is Spanish. <laughs> Exciting. Torn, do you think you could stay on for just a moment? I sure can. All right. Thank Bye, you. everyone. We'll Bye. be connected on Wednesday. In this See you Wednesday. Take care. Bye. Ciao, ciao. So, Torin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're still on. So, I just, I just want to show you someone the issue that I'm having. Why I could not get on to, um, because I just don't want this to happen. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's you know, like technical difficulties happen. There's always some kind of glitch. Yeah, so and I think there, there might be something on our end too. Um, yeah, um, uh, goodbye. Are you still recording, Tracy? Hang on one second.